One thing uh, I really like to do on these planes, and in fact I do it on all my planes, um, is to put this cut in here. And the function of this cut is when the blade is, is in here, you get little scrunchings, little tears flowing by the side of the plane and they jam up alongside the blade, especially in the Japanese blade which is uh, tapered back in this area and they can fill up enough that they'll rub the surface and give a little polish on the surface or st even stop the blade from cutting they've so jammed up and it takes a bit of you either have to back the blade out to get rid of them or you have to tediously get in there with something that's not going to damage the blade and get those shavings out um, i don't have a demonstration of that right now but i think you'll see when you're planing with your planes um, that that fills up and i do this cut which is going to look like this here on all my planes Western Japanese um, functionally this is a vertical cut 90 to the sole angled off to the side and then this is a relief cut that goes back and meets that 90 degree cut vertical cut um, this is very shallow a 32nd of an inch doesn't need to be any more than that but this allows the shavings to find their way out here most of the time anyway find their way out here and to be eventually discharged out there at least it helps them along not always foolproof but uh, I find I think you'll find there's less maintenance when you're using the tool with these cuts so this is uh, if I'm correct called Mimi in Japanese which means ear so these are angled back you know, 5 or 10 degrees, cut is down vertical, basically, and also parallel to the surface, so the cut's straight down until you reach that chamfer that we set in there. And then gently relieve that cut. Let's not get too ambitious, let's not take too big a cut, because if you overdo it, you're going to crash into this and you're liable to split some wood out which you don't want to do all right i want to get that just down to about there so this cut goes from this point to where you've done that point there Do the same on the other side. Gentle cut. Just about like that. Let's try that again. So that's it for that. Okay, so we're going to uh, drill for the pin, the cross pin that holds the chip breaker. Uh, the chip breaker is not a wedge for the blade, it operates independently. You, uh, and as you see, since we've set this plane up, um, we've been able to plane with just the blade in it, no need of a chip breaker. So the advantage of this is you can adjust the chip breaker up and down. If you need to take a rough cut, you back the chip breaker off, hog off a lot of material, you want to make a fine tear out free cut, you can tap the chip breaker right down to the edge and get tear out free cuts. And do that in one plane and without major readjustment of the main blade. Um, now, up until this point, I was shown this by a Japanese craftsman. Uh, he didn't show me how to do the pin, and so um, I've been doing it uh, different ways over the years. Uh, it's a bit of risk because your tolerance is really quite close on this, and your adjustment is um, limited. But there is adjustment, and there are things that you can do to correct 
for a misdrilled pin. I feel encouraged because I've come across some, uh, some planes and some very high-end Japanese planes who face the same challenge. Now this is a die from a very expensive um, Japanese plane. The maker is stamped on here. I got this second hand. I didn't beat this up. Someone else did. Um, but when I looked at it, this pin's been filed. And in fact, it looks like it's been filed and rotated more than once to get the fit. So this pin, I would assume, was slightly misdrilled. And the maker had to come back and file this face. Uh, it was probably fitted too tight and file this face back in order to get the chip breaker to seat properly. So it's one thing you can do. If you put the pin too close, you can file um, file it back flat until the chip breaker is parallel to the pin and is in the right position. If you misdrill it a little too far out and the chip breaker is a little too loose, you can fit a larger pin. And to do that, you take a rat tail file and get in there and file the pin, file that hole bigger but in the direction towards the chip breaker so that you can actually move um, the pin closer to the chip breaker to tighten up that fit. You can use, uh, you can buy pins for these. Uh, Heated Tool in Berkeley, H-I-D-A, uh, usually has them. Um, no need to necessarily do that. You can go to the hobby shop, get yourself some steel or brass pins. Uh, easily enough to get it in different diameters if you miss drill and have to uh, shift, shift the pin position. And um, it can be quite ad hoc. Many of the uh, planes, I would suspect from smaller makers, uh, and the more uh, affordable plane, shall we say. This is a compass plane. Um, I've taken these apart, and this is usually a nail. And it's been drilled on one side, inserted, and hammered into the far side, and not so far that it protrudes. And then clipped off. I mean, this one's really obvious. It's been clipped off with a pair of pliers. Um, and if you look at this one in particular, I don't know if you can see it there, but it's not parallel or perpendicular to the length of the body. So it's off a little bit. And if I were to sight down from the top into here, it's actually not quite seating uh, the chip breaker there. It's quite tight here. Uh, this plane and this small width functions pretty well like this. If I started to have problems with the chip breaker jamming or losing its adjustment, I would come back and rework this pin until I get a nice solid seating of the chip breaker. So, uh, the Japanese uh, like to do things in tenths, decimals, and um, the pin on this line is usually located uh, about five tenths of the height, which on my one inch block here conveniently comes really close to five eighths, which I've got my combination square set at. And we'll mark the other side as well. Now, couple ways, well, more than one way you can do it. I've actually set the blade on here. We set it right on my blade angle line, which is right there in its approximate position. This is tougher uh, on one side than the other, depending on which you're right or left-handed. I put the chip breaker in approximate position. Lay that on there, put the chip breaker up against it. Wrong line, there, that line there. And then mark this line. 
um, regardless if you use this technique or not, which is a bit wobbly, you'll put it in the vise. You can also use a uh, bevel gauge, or in this case, I'm going to use the gauge that I started with, uh, which is this one, and lay that on there. And let's actually be super secure and clamp this on our line. Uh, we have to make sure the clamp doesn't distort its position. All right. And we want to, theoretically, it would be down to its final position, but in order to give us some play, I'm going to move the chip breaker up that way a little bit to give a little bit thinner wedge. So I've marked it there. I'm going to bring it up to the top. I'm going to carry that line over. Um, it's more for cross-checking than for, for a critical layout. Bring that across and that cross. Well, let's do it on the other side and see how close our um, chip breaker lines line up. All right, I've um, clamped the uh, jig there. My little angle, angle measuring device there. And I'm going to mark the line, especially with the intersection here. Uh, down, yeah, up there. Let's transfer it up. Well, by miracles of television, they've exactly lined up, uh, which is wonderful. We don't always uh, <laughs> quite that close. So let's, for reassurance, Let's transfer also those lines of the chip breaker to the inside. Now, you want the chip breaker to start engaging the pin about like that and start to tightening up. Uh, if you find it's really starting to stop moving at this point underneath the pin, then you'll have to readjust the ears on the chip breaker. If you've run out of adjustment there, you may have to file the pin. Uh, so that's our, our goal. I'm going to transfer our angle to the inside here. And television miracles have come to an end. That doesn't quite line up. Um, that one almost does. So I'm going to take a piece of scrap here. I'm going to clamp it on that chip breaker line. And I'm going to use a brad point of the same diameter and use that as a marking gauge and that intersection right there that becomes our center point of the drill bit so i'm also going to use this put it up against the stop block and use it as a center point here. So I seem to be favoring this side. So let's transfer a similar mark to the inside. This may help us with reference. We'll do it right off the chip breaker.
Okay. Let's remove this. And I'm going to get this started by hand because I find it uh, a bit tedious to position it under the drill press. Uh, this can I can see very clearly I'm tight to the line as I like. Give that a little start so I get a good registration on the drill press. I'll take it over the drill press. Well, that's our hole off the drill press. Uh, looks a little tight. We'll see how that that goes. Uh, this is the old uh, die that I'm replacing, and I'm going to drive the old pin out. And reuse it. nicely fit. Let's see how much of a struggle we have to get it out. Pretty good. Just about. All right. Now, it looks like at some point in time I've pulled it out with pliers. But what you want to do is you want to give a little chamfer to the insertion end. Uh, this could be helpful actually to help keep the pin in, though I've really never had one loosen up. Let's see how our fit is here. Use a wooden mallet for that. Well, I was feeling a lot of resistance, the pin going in. Um, sometimes when you drill through, could be a little variation in the diameter here. Could be the wood compressed after you, you drilled the hole. Uh, let's open this up a little bit. But let's. Uh, oh yeah, much better. But don't go opening it up a lot. We still want that snug. We just want to make sure we're not going to split out the... That's better. Yeah. So, it's hitting pretty nicely where we went there. So, I'm going to... Um, Put that back on the drill press. Let's double check before we do that. Remember this is a razor edge, it's as sharp as your blade edge. So don't think you can pick it up by that. Oh, I think we did pretty well here. We're definitely within adjustment. Tolerances. So now we're going to find out how those plier marks got on that pin. So what I've got, you may not be able to see it. I'll reinforce it with the pencil if I. Whoops! If I can, almost got it. That's my line there that I scribed with the brad point. 
So I'm going to put it back on the drill press, put the bit all the way through, and try and nail that line with the point and finish off through the, uh, through the die. Well, the cross vise is exactly where I left it. And uh, so that goes in nicely. I can see through the opening some lights coming through the mouth of the die. Let's see where. And very nicely, we're hitting that center point that I marked uh, across. So I'm going to go ahead and finish drilling this. I got a little piece of scrap underneath there. Hopefully, that'll keep her from splitting out. Okay, I'm going to, some issues with uh, the cross vise, etc. Let me finish this up by hand. We have definitely accurate enough now. I'm going to finish this off by hand because uh, there's a couple things happening over at the drill press. And that's the other thing. I have run in. When you get the bigger, bigger planes, you run out of drill. You may have to drill in from both sides. So I want to make sure this is all the way in there so I get to maximum uh, uh, accuracy. And we're almost there. We've got maybe a 30 second. You can see the point. Looks a little tight. And I think we can make it work though. Still need a little bit more bit. There we go. And let's see if that goes in. Goes in nicely. It looks a bit snug over there. Hopefully, pretty parallel. Let's see uh, how close we are. Oh, looks like we might be okay. Let's put this down pretty close to its final. do is this can be really hard to see and you can see how constricting the uh, throat is here. You want to find a position where the blade turns black and the light hits the edge of the chip breaker or vice versa. Actually when you get close you want to find a place where the light catches the blade and the chip breaker turns black. And it depends on your light condition. Now, it's actually catching the chip breaker on both sides. And we're down pretty close. So we're in luck. I don't think we have to adjust the chip breaker. Um, I discussed that a little earlier. If that was too tight, and we'll get the anvil out here 
demonstrate I think I this again. But if that was uh, too tight, you bridge the ear. Take a light hammer. <clears throat> Probably went a little heavier than this, but this one will work. <clears throat> and flatten the ear out. If it's too loose, you hold the chip breaker over the edge here and bend that tab over. And you do that trial and error, but also this has to sit on here without making any clicking sounds. Now I got a little clicking there. That could be adjusted. Got it. So it's good. So what remains is even though and we can give this a try right this minute. Let's see what condition the um, blade and the die is still. Hear that hard sound? That's a good die. Almost metallic. So, did you get anything? Ah. So, as you can see, it's working pretty well. I could probably get a thinner shaving. This is cherry, and it's a pretty hard piece of cherry. So what will happen is the action of the wedge, of the wedge, excuse me, it is not a wedge, the action of the chip breaker will depress the die usually and hold it off the work. So you have to re-flatten. Um, the bottom of the plane. Now right now I've adjusted that uh, chip breaker way down and there's just a tiniest bit of black line against the light that's being caught on the end of the chip breaker. The blade down, especially if it's set in its final position, Ge generally don't set it in its final position until the chip breaker is very close to its final position because the blade will want to move and move a lot. So I can actually see the blade out a little bit. This means this is low here and we can we'll back this off a little bit because I don't want to damage the straight edge but or the blade. But we want pressure on there to check. So we take our straight edges and put them up to the light. And yes, very definitely, after three quarters of an inch is in contact back here. And you can see light here at the mouth, which is where you want to have, absolutely want to have contact. So, okay, when I'm flattening, I usually start with a scraper. Uh, we did this previously for when we just set the blade. Well, it would help if I set it. Um, this kind of gives me a gross overall flat, which I can then finesse. the blade without going into the throat. Now, it's not the end of the world if I hit the throat. 
and I'll know I'll, the back is at least flush with it. And most of what I want to take off is in this area here. Somewhat would be described about like that. That's the part that's seeing the most pressure from the from the blade. So we can check that. Ooh, not too bad. It's about flush now. I want to give it a little extra. There's some variations as we work. Slightly deeper settings of the plane of the blade. Let's take a little more off there. And I see I've caught the throat there. Well, at least we know we're down even. Let's do a whole stroke across there. Very nice. Let's relieve an area in front. This will reduce the area we have to be concerned about being flat and in line or planar. No pun intended. Uh, and now we want to relieve the area right behind the blade. A little more. I'm being kind of lazy here because the weight of the scraper is out a little more on one side than the other. Uh, but a lot of times you can use that to your advantage for controlling the type of cut you want. So I find that um, cut to be rather rough. I like to come back and ferret down with this card scraper. Smooth it out a little bit. Okay, definitely Have the area immediately behind uh, lower than the mouth. I'm going to relieve this down a little bit more behind here. To reduce any incidental contact there. Sometimes you neglect a, a place and that's the one place that holds you off. So, uh, especially since I've been using this a little bit to try it, definitely needs to be chamfered. Try and miss the pin there. Uh, this is okay. We could break that a little bit, make sure that we don't split it. As you can see here, awkward strikes have split that out actually. You can go, you can do the second chamfer as well. I usually don't bother. And in order to get this one, you're going to have to see, I've already dented it a little bit there. It's fine. It's going to get a little wear, but you want to get. I'm going to knock these corners off because a miss strike will chip that off. Uh, you can uh, take it a little further and use a file. And I say this somewhat jokingly uh, to not defile the um, plane with sandpaper, but uh, let's not get self serious here but there is this very serious issue about flattening the bottom which I kind of took for granted in the beginning and wanted to show you the traditional way of flattening the bottom 
and that is you don't ever use sandpaper to flatten the bottom uh, and don't on any wood plane and you'll see a lot of people doing it it embeds grit the, sand, the grit from the sandpaper breaks off and embeds in the wood that's the first thing and I've seen proof of this under the microscope uh, it will then break off out of the wood and dull your blade not dramatically but when you you'll notice a change in the sharpness of, uh, of the blade and when you put it underneath uh, the magnifier you'll see there's a whole bunch of bunches of little scratches all over the edge of the blade that's the um, uh, grit breaking off and uh, being planed by the blade the other reason is it's really inefficient it tends to round at the incoming and outgoing pressure on different corners as you may realize when you're sharpening different things uh, can um, take more off on that area uh, with this controlled scraping you know exactly where you're working how much you're taking off you can double check it you're not working blind with the dye between you and the sandpaper or the sole not knowing what's happening there so um, don't use sandpaper for that